Christmas 1988, at London's Heathrow International Airport, the magic of the season has taken hold. There is a special excitement here, the anticipation of going home for the holidays, the thrill of a vacation of a lifetime. First Lieutenant Jordy Williams is held up in traffic and misses his plane. He calls his parents to tell them he'll be arriving later on Pan Am Flight 103, bound for Kennedy Airport in New York. 16-year-old Melina Hudson is on the same flight. She's been in England on a student exchange and is heading home. 29-year-old Yvonne Owen is on her way to Boston to spend Christmas with her American boyfriend. Her 18-month-old son, Bryony, is the flight's youngest passenger. Flight attendant Stacy Franklin is still learning the ropes. She is the newest of the 15 crew members on Flight 103, just beginning her career. She's excited, and so are the 243 passengers on their way to America, despite a departure delay of 25 minutes. At 6.25 p.m. on Wednesday, December 21st, Pan Am Flight 103 leaves Heathrow Airport and flies into history. On board, passengers settle in as the crew works to make them more comfortable for the long flight. Seasoned travelers try to sleep, hoping to awaken at their destination. But their fate has been decided by strangers. Silently, Deep within the bowels of the cargo hold beneath their feet, a terrorist bomb waits patiently. Some folks in Scotland will tell you that New Year's is the time for the Scots. But in the village of Lockerbie, everyone was already enjoying the season. The children are already off from school, and Christmas decorations have been up for weeks. Lockerbie has been a, a rural community, really, for the last 200 years. Uh, it's a, an agricultural town. Various uh, churches and uh, other organisations were all having the, their parties for the elderly and for the young. And uh, basically everybody was looking forward, as they did every year, um, to Christmas coming along. Alan Riddett could tell you how typical Lockerbie is. His parents and in-laws still live there. Alan lives in nearby Newton Stewart, where he serves as a firefighter. But Lockerbie is still his home. It was well known, I think, to most people because it's, it sits on one of the major transportation routes, road rail, and funnily enough, by aircraft crews because Lockerbie was known as almost a turning point for aircraft going from Heathrow before they turned over the North Atlantic. Shortly after 7 p.m. on December 21st, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 is doing just that. An air traffic controller at Prestwick Airport near Glasgow has just spoken to the captain and tracks his progress as Flight 103 rises to 31,000 feet. Suddenly at 7.05 p.m., the 747 disappears from radar scopes. When the terrorist bomb explodes, it tears a hole in the 747's fuselage, creating shock waves that rip through the rest of the plane, breaking it into five pieces. They fall like bombs from the sky, heading for the village of Lockerbie. The noise was actually the, the aircraft engines coming down because they had broken up from the rest of the aircraft. One of them fell onto the roadway about 100 yards from where I was and shook the house. And of course I got up and uh, ran to my front door and looked out. There was a huge fireball in the sky. And there was drops of that fuel landing on the street and then the rooftops exploding, bursting out in flames. But you could feel the heat in your arms and your face, it was so warm. The flaming wreckage hits the unsuspecting villagers in two main neighborhoods, Rosebank on the town's north side and Sherwood Crescent in the south. 
A large piece of wing full of fuel hurtles to the ground at the south end of Sherwood Crescent, sending a ball of fire 300 feet into the air, instantly turning two of the houses into a blazing crater 70 feet wide and 30 feet deep. The concussion rocks more homes along the crescent, setting them on fire. Pavements were on fire. Some of the gas pipes had ruptured. The uh, hedges alongside them were burning, trees were burning, houses were burning. There was uh, glass breaking all around about as the heat got so intense. By another twist of fate, Alan Riddett is the first fire officer on the scene. He radios for help, and his is the first confirmed report of a plane crash in Lockerbie. When Alan arrives at the crater site, he realizes the full extent of the damage. He calls for more assistance, declaring the situation a major disaster. It was a nut, for me, a natural reaction. This has happened. I'm a professional firefighter. I can do something now. I should do something. It was subconscious. I don't think there was a conscious decision then. I never had time to deal with the fright and fear. I spent quite a long time down there on my own with no fire engines, nothing. So it was professionally, it was very lonely and difficult to decide what to do. And I was very, very pleased when the first fire engine appeared out of the smoke, uh, run in front of it and stopped it and, and ordered the crews where I wanted them to go. Residents of Lockerbie realize the enormity of what has happened in Rosebank Crescent when they find the remains of the plane's rear passenger section. It was difficult to comprehend the scene there because it turned out there was over 60 bodies in this mess, absolute mess. And this was the area where there was people in, on roofs, young children in trees, nobody alive. Very, very difficult to, to deal with from a human perspective. The nose cone went about three miles out of the town, away to the east, and from Lockerbie out to where this uh, nose cone came down, there was literally a carpet of people across the golf course. Rescue teams are not the only ones to converge on Lockerbie. Members of the media have been alerted to the disaster, including correspondent David ben -Arie. In 12 hours, the population of a town of 3,000 doubled to over 6,000 people. Journalists, rescue personnel, you name it, they were there. The images of that night will be with me for the rest of my life. The most eerie thing was, where I parked my car, there were 37 ambulances standing, waiting for survivors. The real tragedy of Lockerbie was that they waited in vain. The town itself, the people in the town, they coped very well. They volunteered to help us in all ways that they could. And a pickup arrived with a farmer driving it. And as he got out, I saw that he was in tears. He went round to the back of the pickup, lifted up a tarpaulin, and carried out the body of a child that could be no more than three. He walked into the mortuary, handed the body in, came out and picked up another body of a child. It was very distressing to have to deal with the children. The uh, adults I could accept that, right, OK, they've had a reasonable life, but you can't say that about uh, children who are only months old. It was like a nightmare. To see all the personal belongings lying strewn about passports, IDs of people who were obviously had a lot of life in front of them, or should have had a lot of life in front of them. The crew and passengers of Flight 103 aren't the only victims. Lives have been lost on the ground as well. In Sherwood Crescent, the 70-foot crater is all that remains of two homes and the people who live there. That is where the 11 people of Lockerbie died. Two families and the other individuals. We knew these people. 
and we talked to them, we met them every day in our daily lives. It is not long before others arrive in Lockerbie, mostly from the United States. They are the relatives and friends who have come to grieve Jordy Williams, the young Army Lieutenant, Melina Hudson, the teenage exchange student, and all the passengers and crew who will never come home. There are no survivors of Pan Am Flight 103, all victims of man's cold, calculating hand. The only survivors are the people of Lockerbie, victims themselves, who are there to greet those who come to mourn. And it is one of the great attributes of the townsfolk that they united to enfold those grieving souls in love and compassion. There was always somebody there with each relative to listen. If they needed a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, it appeared. On February 2nd, 1989, the last 17 victims of the disaster are buried. A single oak casket contains their ashes, where their bodies are never found. They are buried here in the gigantic crater where they died. 270 souls have been laid to rest. Their graves in a quiet Scottish town called Lockerbie will serve as constant reminders of man's inhumanity to man. It will always have uh, some kind of part in history. I, I think time mellows greatly, but it will never go away. If the plane had blown up two seconds before, it would have landed in the field. But uh, on the night, it, uh, it just landed in the town of Lockerbie. 